I will be forever the mess. You're the king of kings, <laughs> There's always a pecking order. The little peckers never mess with the big peckers. So I'm a rooster, and he's a chicken. <laughs> All right, welcome to episode two, season four of the Bygling Legends podcast, brought to you by our sponsors, Redcon One, Old School Labs, and Florida Alternative Medicine. All right, we are talking about the 1990 Mr. Olympia. I'm your host, John Hansen, and today our special guest is going to be Sean Ray, and Sean, of course, was one of the top bodybuilders in the 1980s and 1990s. He placed, I think, in the top five of the Mr. Olympia 13 years in a row, which is an incredible accomplishment when you think about the consistency it must have took to beat uh, all the guys from his era and then all the new guys coming up. So Sean is definitely one of the best bodybuilders in bodybuilding history and he was in third place in that 1990 Mr. Olympia and the interesting story of that is that earlier in the year in March he failed the drug test at the 1990 Arnold Classic which was the first time either one of those contests were ever drug tested. And Sean won his first Arnold Classic, which was the second Arnold Classic they ever had in 1990. And then a few weeks after the contest, he was informed that he failed the drug test. So then he continued training. And as he'll explain in our interview, he's going to tell us what he did to pass the drug test in 1990. And he looked so good that he ended up taking third place. Sean is one of the most articulate and educated bodybuilders, I think, around. And he always gives great interviews. Uh, He has a lot of opinions, some very articulately. So you're really, really going to enjoy this interview. All right, I want to mention that we are, again, brought to you by Redcon One, my friend Aaron Singerman, and I appreciate their sponsorship. At Redcon One, they believe working hard to achieve your goals. And whether you're killing it in the gym or running a six-minute mile, Redcon One has something for those willing to put in the work. They have a premier clinically dosed pre-workout called Total War that is the perfect companion to your workout to give you that extra push to break through your mental and physical barriers. And then after your workout, you can fuel your body with their revolutionary MRE. It is the only whole food complete meal replacement with protein coming from salmon, chicken, beef, and eggs, and the carbs coming from sweet potatoes and oats. And it also includes 10 grams of fat from MCT oil. It's the best tasting complete meal you'll ever have. So go to redcon1.com and try the very best sports nutrition has to offer. Redcon won the highest state of readiness. And you can enter the discount code LEGENDS and get 15% discount off your order. Again, that's LEGENDS when you order your supplements and you'll get 15% off your order. So thank you to Redcon One. And we're also brought to you by Old School Labs. I've been with Old School Labs for several years now, and this is a supplement company that draws on the wisdom of the golden era of fitness and bodybuilding to offer unique supplements to the discerning athlete. What a great company to sponsor Bodybuilding Legends Podcast, Old School Labs. Old School Labs is the only brand that I use, trust, and associate my name with. They are the brand that I used to win the Masters Natural Mr. Universe contest back in 2012. And they're also the company that sponsors Breon Ansley, who is the new 2017 Classic Physique Olympia champion. And they are also sponsoring Sergio Oliva Jr. And I just got word last week that they are now sponsoring Tom Platts one of the legendary bodybuilders, of course, in the history of bodybuilding. We are hoping one day soon to get an interview with Tom. He said maybe by the end of November. I know he's traveling a lot to Europe to do seminars. The news is, of course, that Tom is now training Sergio Oliva Jr. for the Arnold Classic. So this is really, really great history. One of the great bodybuilders in history, one of the hardest training bodybuilders in history, who competed with Sergio's father, Sergio Sr., at the 1984 Mr. Olympia, and now... Tom is training Sergio Oliva Jr. for the Arnold Classic. So this is really, really exciting stuff. You can use the discount code LEGENDS12 and you'll get 12% off your order at Old School Labs. Go to OldSchoolLabs.com, Old School Labs supplements that make sense. Yeah, that was really exciting news to hear that Tom Platts is training Sergio Oliva Jr. for the Arnold Classic. It's going to be a great Arnold Classic. I've already got my hotel room booked. I definitely intend on going there, and Old School Labs is going to have a booth there, so I will probably be there at the Arnold Classic. If you can make it out there, definitely come and check that out. Sergio Oliva Jr. will be competing. Rami, Big Rami, will also be competing, and I'm sure there's going to be some really great competition, but it's just going to be exciting. As uh, I just heard an interview with Tom on uh, another podcast, and he was saying that 
he was on stage when Sergio held up his baby, Sergio Jr., on stage at the 1984 Mr. Olympia. Now, here we are so many years later, so many decades later, and Sergio Oliva Jr. is now a pro, and he's competing in the Arnold Classic, and Tom Platz is going to train him. So it's really crazy how life works. All right, I had a pretty good weekend. I was out at my friend Mel Chancey's show out in Port Charlotte, and uh, Mel and Tim Gardner promoted the show. It was their second show. And Mel, for those of you who know, he's an old friend of mine. I knew him back in Chicago. And uh, we actually trained together when I won my second Natural Mr. Universe contest in 1996. And Mel was uh, probably one of the best training partners I ever had. He was always on time, always uh, trained very, very hard. And for those of you that know about Mel, he was uh, in the Hells Angels back then, back in the 1990s. He was actually the president of the Hells Angels in Chicago. And uh, he ended up going to prison for a while and got back out. He really changed his life, turned his life around. Moved out to Florida a couple of years ago, and now he's involved heavily with the MPC. He's a good friend of Jim Mannion, who runs the MPC. And Mel has his contest now. This is the second year that he held it. He's going to be doing another show with Branch Warren out in Chicago, which is going to be a big expo type of show like they do at the Europa. So that's going to be big. And uh, he just keeps growing and growing. He's doing more and more. He owned a gym out in uh, Port Charlotte called Second Chance Fitness, which he just recently sold. So uh, Mel's going to be doing more and more in the promotion business. And so it was always great to see Mel. And it's great to see how great he's doing. You know, when I was working out with him back in the 90s, I always thought he was just a great guy, a very personable guy. I couldn't believe he was the head of the Hells Angels. But uh, I knew he would go far if he ever got his life in the right direction. And he certainly has done that. So I'm really proud of where he's come and how he's really turned his life around. I also got a chance to see uh, my old friend Chuck Sanow. And Chuck is a friend that uh, I grew up with in Chicago in the gym. We used to train at Hammer's Gym back in the old days in Chicago Ridge, Illinois. Chuck and I competed as teenagers. I think I'm like two years younger than Chuck, but I actually started competing a little before him, maybe the year before he started competing. But yeah, me and Chuck grew up in the bodybuilding world together, and I saw him rise to the very top. He was probably the best bodybuilder in Illinois for quite a while. And uh, he was first competing in the AAU before the MPC came around. And Chuck did really, really well. I think he took second place at the Junior Mr. America. And he took second place at the Mr. America. He took second place at the AAU Mr. Universe. He had a really great physique, real rock hard condition, great symmetry. And uh, just was really close to getting to the top. And then he finally switched over to the MPC when the MPC started coming around in 1989. And he, uh, same thing, went right to the top. He won, I think, the MPC Illinois State, the MPC Midwest. He won all the shows in uh, AAU and in the MPC in the Illinois area. And then he went to the national level, and uh, he took second at the nationals. I think he might have won his class or took second at the USA. I know he took second at the North America the year that Dexter Jackson won. I think it was in 96 or 98, whenever Dexter won. I think it was 98. And uh, Dexter was a light heavyweight, and Chuck was a heavyweight. And I think Dexter beat him by a four to three vote. So he was one of these guys that had an incredible physique, really close to getting his pro card, but he never got it. Probably the most competitive guy I've ever met in the bodybuilding world. He wanted to win so bad. So finally, Chuck got his pro card, I believe, in 2005 at the Masters Nationals. And uh, they just started giving out the pro cards around that time the guys who won the overall Masters Nationals. So he won that in 2005. So Chuck is the chairman of the MPC out in uh, Illinois. He has been for quite a long time. He's a fireman. He's been a fireman for probably 20 years. And uh, he's promoting a show this weekend, in fact, out in Illinois. He had a great career, great career in bodybuilding, so it was great to catch up with him. And I saw another old friend of mine, Jimmy Mentis, who was a IFBB pro bodybuilder. Jimmy is originally from Greece. He lives out here in Florida now. And he spent quite a few years as a pro bodybuilder. He's dating uh, Bonnie Peterson, who won the figure contest at Mel's Contest. Jimmy is, like I said, a former pro, and he's got Body Fit, which I think is a beauty cream and uh, fat-burning creams and things like that. It's doing really, really well. He's selling a lot of products, so it was good catching up with him. A friend of mine, Jessica Reyes-Padilla, was competing in the figure contest, and she took second place. Jessica has been doing really well. I actually met Jessica... About three years ago in 2014, she was in Tim Gardner's show that was held in the summertime with the Tampa Pro, and she was in the amateur, and she cleaned up. She won the figure open, she won the figure master, she won the figure novice. I think it was only like her second competition, 
and she's from Puerto Rico. She traveled from Puerto Rico and won the contest. And I could tell back then that she had incredible potential. And I think since that time, the following year, she won the junior nationals in the figure in our, her class, and then she got her pro card. So now I think she's won like three professional figure competitions. She's probably 20 pounds heavier than she was when I saw her in 2014. And she was just in the Olympia, in the figure Olympia, and she did really well. I think she made the top 10. So she's really working her way up the ladder. She's in incredible condition. I thought she could have won this contest. I did an interview with her. So check it out on my YouTube channel, or you can go to uh, floridaphysique.com, my other website, and you can see it there. Oh, and the other big news is my book is now available on Amazon.com. It's called The Heroes and Legends of Bodybuilding, Volume 1. And it's a series of stories about the 1970s bodybuilding. I've got a lot of chapters in there about Sergio and Arnold, their rivalry, the 1972 Olympia, and also when Sergio first beat Arnold in 1969, and then when Arnold beat him in 1970. And got stories in there about Frank Zane winning the Olympia. And my one of my idols, Cal Scalac, when he won the uh, 1977 Mr. Universe and then competed in the 1978 Mr. Olympia. And uh, a lot of stories in there. Tony Pearson, when he first won his Mr. America contest. And I've uh, got a whole chapter in there about Sergio Oliva's life. So you want to check that out. It's on Amazon.com. And it's full of a ton of great pictures, as well as some really great stories about the old days of bodybuilding. So... If you're a bodybuilding historian like me or you want to learn more about the history of the sport, then definitely go check out Heroes and Legends of Bodybuilding Volume 1. And like I said, that's on Amazon. And if you want to order directly from me, just contact me at naturalolympia at gmail.com. All right, we did get an email over the last week. I want to read it. Any uh, You guys send out any emails to us, send them again to naturalolympia at gmail.com. This one is from uh, Jim Kerr. And he says, John, I'm really enjoying the Bodybuilding Legends podcast. The 81 Olympia series was fantastic. The show with head judge Roger Schwab was particularly good. I like that one, too. I said, I think his explanation of the flawed point system used in that contest was the cause of the poor decision was right on the money. It should be noted that none other than Jim Mannion gave Franco a perfect score in round two of that contest. I'm not sure about that, but uh, I know Jim, I think Jim and uh, him and Danny in first, after, in the pre-judging at least. It says, in your latest episode, you mentioned my favorite bodybuilder, Sergio Oliva. The first time I saw Sergio was at the IFBB Mr. Illinois contest held at Lane Tech High School Auditorium in about 1964. Sergio was unopposed in the contest. Also at that show was guest poser, as a guest poser, and performing a strong nine act was veteran Chuck Sipes. The Mr. Chicago contest was won by a skinny young guy with the best bodybuilding name ever, Rock Stonewall. <laughs> yeah, I remember Rock. I remember seeing him in uh, many contests. I didn't see him personally, but I remember hearing about him. And then he said, after the show was over, the MC invited the fans to come up on stage and meet the bodybuilders who were still in their posing trunks. I was a skinny 13-year-old eighth grader at the time, and Sergio's waist was probably smaller than mine, despite weighing about 220 pounds. To this day, it is difficult for me to believe that some modern pros weigh over 50 pounds more than Oliva at about the same height. Keep up the good work. All right. Thanks to Jim for that email. Like I said, if you guys want to send more emails out, I'm always happy to hear what you have to say about the uh, podcast. I always want to hear your views on it. So be sure to send those to naturalolympia at gmail.com or go to our website, bodybuildinglegendshow.com and sign up for our mailing list. We should have the new Mike Ashley interview, which will be part two of our interview with him. That should be coming out sometime this week, probably later in the week. I just got to do a little more editing to it, and it'll be ready. And you can see that at the BodybuildingLegendsShow.com website, or you can also see it, of course, on YouTube. And I'm going to be interviewing uh, Eddie Robinson this week. Eddie told me that uh, he wants to do the interview in person at his gym in Largo, so I'm going to head over there this week. And we're going to do an interview with him, so that's going to be really exciting. Eddie, of course, one of the top bodybuilders in the 1980s, and he competed in the 1990 Mr. Olympia, so we're going to get his views on that contest as well. And then he went over to the WBF, but he was one of the most popular bodybuilders in the 1980s and 1990s. I think he won the 1989 Mr. USA contest, and that's where he got his pro card. And then he was on tons of covers, and Joe Weider really liked his look. And uh, he was with Joe Weider for many years, so I'm sure he'll talk to us about that. So I'm really looking forward to that. All right, in our interview today with uh, Sean Ray, I've also got an extra 
edition of a little clip from when Sean was at the 2001 Mr. Olympia, which is his last Mr. Olympia contest. And they had a press conference. And Wayne D'Amelia, who was the head of the IFBB at the time, was overseeing it. And Sean got into a big heated argument with Wayne D'Amelia about the judges and about how this how they score the contest. So we're going to play that at the very end of our interview. So after the interview's over, don't turn your podcast off because we've got an extra special addition to our interview, and that is the clip of Sean talking to Wayne D'Amelia at the 2001 Mr. Olympia press conferences, which was one of the most heated press conferences ever. So stay tuned for that after the interview is over. And I also want to mention we are also brought to you by Florida Alternative Medicine, where age is just a number. If you want to feel great, optimize your energy levels, burn fat, and, of course, balance your hormone levels to maximize your potential, then go see the experts at Florida Alternative Medicine and Weight Loss. They have a certified and knowledgeable staff that will work with you to achieve your goals and get you the results you've been looking for. And they offer a wide range of services to ensure that you will not only look and feel amazing, but also be comfortable knowing that they're there for you every step of the way. They offer very competitive pricing along with their quality products and services. So give them a call for more information and experience firsthand what sets them apart from the rest. So you can call them at their number, which is 813-906-6737, or go to their website, which is flalternativemeds.com. That's flalternativemeds.com. And if you're doing it online, you can use the promotion code LEGEND and get a free consultation and get 20% off any packages. So call them up at 813-906-6737 and check them out. All right, here is our interview with Sean Ray, one of the best bodybuilders of the 1980s and the 1990s, third place winner at the 1990 Mr. Olympia. And as I said, make sure to stay tuned right after the interview is over for that 2001 press conference between Sean and Wayne D'Amelio. You'll really enjoy that. Here you go. All right, welcome back to the Bodybuilding Legends podcast. And my very special guest this week is Sean Ray. And Sean was one of the greatest bodybuilders in the history of bodybuilding. And we are talking, of course, about the 1990 Mr. Olympia with this season. And Sean was a big part of that, taking third place in uh, that contest. Welcome to the show, Sean. All right, John. Good to be back. By the way, you're doing a great job. The stories, uh, getting these athletes to open up about how they felt during the time they were competing is just uh, it's something the sport's long been overdue. And it's good to hear it at the ripe old age of 52. These guys, uh, <laughs> the majority of them sound like they're in a very good place. Some, uh, some yeah. bodybuilders I know, some of the guys are very bitter, but to hear them talk and open up to you very candidly is doing a service to the sport, so keep up the great work. Thanks, John. I appreciate that. Well, it's always a pleasure talking to you as well, because in addition to being a great bodybuilder, I think you're one of the most articulate and intelligent uh, bodybuilders out there, so it's always great to get your opinion. And I want to congratulate you for just signing with Generation Iron and also for doing that great uh, commentary at the Olympia with uh, Dan Solomon. It was really well done. Yeah, thank you. I, I mean, when I started bodybuilding, John, I was already working in commentary and television. I think you see a little bit more uh, yeah. now because the World Wide, World Wide Web hits a, a broader audience, but that's what I've always loved to do. And it's good that, uh, you know, being where I'm at at this point in time, I'm able to continue giving back to the sport and, and being a fan, number one. Uh, but watching yeah. the evolution of the sport and also being close to the athletes, doing what I once loved uh, is it's a very humbling experience sometimes to, to watch them go through it all and, and kind of have to break them down because, you know, they love you when you praise them and they can't stand mm-hmm. you when you critique them. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I remember you doing uh, commentary for ESPN. I think the your Matarazzo won the uh, USA and also uh, Flex, right? You were doing it then. Yeah, to, to put it in context, that was back in 91 and 92. Um, mm-hmm. And I was work. I was working with Lou Zwick, and I got started back, and I believe it was like '88 when we had American Muscle. So I've been doing this for quite some time, and it's it's evolved. The reaction now is different because the athletes normally couldn't respond to the commentary; they they didn't have a platform to respond. And now with social media, as soon as you say a guy is like his posing is less than stellar or his stomach's hanging out, uh, you got their wives, their girlfriends, their boyfriends coming after you. So I try to keep my commentary to the men. It's a little easier to do, but everybody's got an opinion, uh, you know. So I'm, I'm, I try to keep it 100, and I try to give my, keep my commentary to where it's constructive. The athletes need to hear what they need to work on to be complete because my perception of the sport is the guys with the fewest flaws should win, 
and the guys that are competing that have flaws, they need to be they need to know what those flaws are because so many of yeah. them are surrounded by yes men. You got your trainer that you train you pay to train you, your guru that helps you out, your girlfriend or your wife that helps you out, and everyone's saying that you look great. Then you get on the stage and you realize you don't. Well, it's my job to point out what's wrong so that when they go back to the gym, they know what to work on. Right. Exactly. Well, um, we're talking about the 1990 Olympia with this uh, broadcast. Before we start talking about that, I want to talk a little bit about your earlier career because I think a lot of people feel that, you know, whether they do drug testing or not, the people that are going to place at the top of the sport are the ones with the greatest genetics. And I think Lee Haney said that, and Lee won that contest. But you had, obviously, great genetics because I remember when you were competing as a teenager, you just dominated teenage bodybuilding, and then you won the – 85 uh, team nationals, right? And then you won a, a World correct. Games or something too, correct, Sean? World Championship. World Championship over in Sydney, Sydney, Australia back in December, 85, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, and you were only uh, um, a teenager at the time. Well, I'll give you a little perspective on that because, you know, we watch Michael Jordan and we wonder, like, we see the net result of his years of youth commitment in the gym and he gets to the NBA and he does all these awesome things and you wonder he's just playing on a whole different level. And then you take a guy like Shaquille O'Neal and you see him in the NBA and, you know, he can't hit a free throw to save his life, but he's been shooting free throws since he's in, you know, eighth grade. Different people respond differently to different stimuli. I mean, I'm a red meat guy. I know some bodybuilders, they have to diet on fish and chicken mm-hmm. and they can't, they can't eat red meat. I know Flex Wheeler was dieting on hamburgers and fries along with Vince Taylor. Genetics, metabolism, there's so many other things that factor into who's going to do what. But at the end of the day, this is a sport of potential. All the guys that get in it potentially have the ability to you know, rise to the cream of the crop, but the mind is the strongest muscle. And I think what separates the good bodybuilders from great bodybuilders a lot of times has to do with the mindset. I came out of the box, you know, fast and furious. You know, 1983, I started lifting weights. Uh, 1987, I was winning my pro card. So uh, to put things in context, I graduated high school in 1984. So 1987 mm-hmm. was three was only three years out of high school. Um, yeah. That that's not normal. It's not typical. Um, what what was different for me? I mean, I was coming out of a disciplined sport of football. I played from eight to eighteen. Uh, I excelled. I, I don't want to toot my own horn, but I was like the MVP every year. Um, I was in the high school hall of fame. I I was very committed to playing football, but I was also aware that I had my limitations. I was short. Um, and I fell in love with with bodybuilding after I got injured. And I took to bodybuilding the same way I played the game of football. And I was all in. Uh, mm-hmm. When I do seminars, my, when I do seminars, when people talk to me about bodybuilding, I approach bodybuilding the way that Mike Tyson approached boxing. We're, we're roughly the same age, and our careers kind of paralleled each other. Um, Mike was a student of the game. He can tell you the heavyweight champion in the 19 early 1900s. He knew. Everything that happened with Jack Dempsey and the Brown Bomber and Sugar Ray Robinson all the way through Muhammad Ali and Larry Holmes and all those guys. I can do the same thing. I can look at a forearm and tell you whose forearm it was in (laughs) bodybuilding. I was all in in terms of the history, Mm -hmm. origin, the athletes that laid the foundation. So I eat, sleep, and breathe bodybuilding to the degree that once I won the team nationals and the junior world championships and I walked into Joe Weider's office in 1986 and came out with a cover shot, I, I almost felt like well, this is, this is how it works. This is how it's supposed to be. Like when I got my yeah. pro card in 87, when I got my pro card in 87, it was a formality of the hard work that I put in. I didn't realize I had condensed that timeline. Like it happened in, in three years, you know, out of high school, whereas someone like Roy Lelemeyer or Matt Mendenhall never turned pro, but I watched them year after year continually try and try and try, and they had all the goods physically. Um, mm-hmm. Something – Something wasn't there, and it, you can't narrow that down to drugs, John. You can't because the playing field is level if everybody's able to take whatever the hell they want to take. You take what you yeah. want. You take what you want. At the end of the day, it's a bodybuilding show. You, it doesn't take the place of training. It doesn't take the place of genetics. It doesn't take the place of, of commitment. And everyone on that stage trains hard and is very committed. But some people have a disposition that's – superior than others the way that Michael Jordan played the game of basketball they just rise above it when the time is right and for me it seemed like throughout my teenage career to the nationals everything fell in place and I I gave an interview following the national championships what are you going to do now that you're pro I said well I'll probably lose more shows than I win but I'd like to be Mr. Olympia one day and that was 
that's a telling commentary in 87 at 22 years old because that was true. I went on to only win two pro shows. Uh, I got a very good sniff at the Olympia belt, the Olympia title, but it never mm-hmm. actually happened. But I, I was a realist because the the depth of, of the field got a lot deeper after I came out of the Nationals. I mean, the gene pool on the Olympia stage is very, was very limited to not good bodybuilders, but great bodybuilders. I was just one of them. Yeah. It's interesting you say that you uh, had an injury during football. I remember you, I remember your football career because I remember you set those records and a lot of those were never even broken. You were a great football player in high school, but I didn't know you had an injury. It's sort of like uh, Lee Haney too, right? He broke his leg a couple of times playing football and then he realized he was more genetically gifted for uh, bodybuilding. Well, I got to tell you, I sprained my knee. I didn't break it. I, I, they put me in a cast for a week. They told me to wear it for five. I, I cut it off me and my brother after one week. They put me in a brace for five weeks. Uh, we loosened it up one notch every day for one week and we took it off and I started doing the, uh, the, the stationary bike. And then I started doing leg extensions. I had already been lifting weights. So I was like, I just want to get healthy again. But in doing that, it was like my body was changing and my drive to be normal was, was superseded my will to want to get back on a football field. Cause mind you, I was, I was an all-star. So in the summer of 84, I was supposed to be playing in the all-star football game and I chose to go do the teenage um, nationals. And that's where I got second place to Franco Santarillo in Detroit, Michigan. And yeah. when I got second when I got second place in that show, which was the same weekend as that all-star football game, now it's time for me to go to college. I have to make a decision. It's going to either go to college and play football or go to college and come back and try to win this team national championship because I was 18 at that time. I chose to come back for the team nationals in Atlanta, Georgia in 85, and I won it, and it launched the, the beginning of my career. It's where I, it took off. So you could see your potential then for bodybuilding, right? Because I remember we had this conversation well, before where when you used to come out on the stage in the teenage, the audience would start laughing. They said, is this a joke? This guy's supposed to be in the men's <laughs> open, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I was at an advantage because I trained at a gym where, you know, John Brown was two-time Mr. Universe, three-time Mr. World. So mm-hmm. I had I could see I could see the fruit of his labor, and I desired that. You know, he had Mercedes. He was traveling the world. He was on magazines. I could see the in. I could see the end line, and I began traveling back and forth to Gold's Gym, which was a 45-minute drive. And being a teenager with no friends that were bodybuilders, I had to. I, I was going into Gold's Gym. It was like walking into Muscle and Fitness. Yeah. So I could. The desire for me to want to be on that wall. The desire for me to want to be up there with Chris Dickerson and Tom Platts and Mike Christian. I mean, I lived that whole thing from 1984. I should say 83 because I was I walked into World's Gym and Bob Paris was doing his photo shoot with Artie Zeller. And while he was doing his photo shoot with Artie Zeller in World's Gym, I had Danny Padilla was right there. Uh, Berto Fox was over there. Rachel McKilklish and Mike uh, Matt Mindenhall were walking down the stairs. They were dating at that time. And mm-hmm. Rachel was Ms. Olympia, Ms. Olympia in 82. So I, I know all the backstories, and I'm here I am, 17, 18 years old. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it. So when I go home to my house, I walk in my room. My, my closet's got all these pit people that I just got done seeing that are real people at the gym. So I wanted to be one of those guys. So my desire to be a bodybuilder superseded my desire to get back on a football field, which – you know, I had already felt like I dominated. Like there was nowhere for me to go in football except for maybe I get hurt again. And in bodybuilding, I felt like invincible. I felt I can handle, I can yeah. control this. I saw people like Tom Platt and Chris Dickerson and Samir Benu that were my height, and I believed that I could be one of those guys. Mm. I see, yeah. So the, that's, and then you that's did... what I said about the mind. That's what I was saying about yeah. the mind being a very, very strong. My mind drove me to believe that I could be like that. If I just do the work, yeah, you could see the limitations with football, but in bodybuilding, you were you could compete against guys who were your own height. Yeah, I saw those football players. I'm like, there's look, this is back when Eric Dickerson came to LA to play football for the Rams, and I would see him at El Torito and El Paso Cantina. He's six three. Yeah. I'm like, this is the run. This is the running back. I'm five seven. <laughs> I mean, right. we sh- I, sh- I shake his hand, and my hand would disappear. So I didn't yeah. feel like it would be. And Eddie George, I mean, all these these running backs were six feet and up, and they were fast. And I just thought, you know, I'd be a scat back at best. I might have a, a halfway decent college career, but I just didn't believe that I could play on the level of the NFL because my my height. But in bodybuilding, 
I was walking amongst guys and I was looking eye to eye. These guys were short. I thought, mm-hmm. Danny Padilla? Danny Padilla. I mean, they look like they're six feet tall and they look like they're 300 pounds, but in person, they became human and very realistic to me. I wasn't overwhelmed. Right. Now, how did you feel in 86 when you went into the Junior Nationals and then you went up against another genetic freak, uh, Eddie Robinson, who was only a year older than you? You were only 20 and he was only 21. Yeah, and I, I watched his career. He's he, he was on the East Coast in Florida, Clearwater, and I'm out here in California. So I knew he was out there. We were on mm-hmm. a collision course. There was no question. And going to that Junior Nationals in Niagara Falls, he was the guy for me to beat. And apparently I was supposed to be the guy for him to beat. And we knew that Daryl Stafford was going to be there and a few others. But uh, he was a very strong powerlifting guy. And I thought, I'm not going to beat him pound for pound. i got to come in ripped. i got to come in shape. And I think what I did is I sacrificed size for detail. And I mm-hmm. actually over dieted for that show. I believe I was 186 in that contest in the light heavyweight mm-hmm. division, and he, yeah. and he was tapping out at like 197. He was just under um, the weight limit. At the, he was at the top of the weight limit, and you could right. see it in his legs. His legs were huge and smooth. His arms were like cannons. They 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 were 20 inches probably at that time. And mm-hmm. he was a bench presser. You know, he was very powerful. So his his shoulder girth was super super wide, uh, and his legs were super super sweeps like like Victor Richard so he had a very cartoon character look to him but he also looked like he was several weeks away from being in shape but mm-hmm. I was too dieted I, I looked very slender and athletic where he looked very muscular he reminded me like of a Matt Mincer or Mike Mincer a lot of muscle not a lot of detail but when he yeah. hit his abs they came, they came in just enough to make me kind of look small and I mm-hmm. took that defeat I, I took that defeat and I knew uh, from that I needed to go. I just needed maturity. I needed more time. And yeah, and I was going to. I knew I I knew I would have another crack at Eddie Robinson in the short near future. Um, so that night, that '86 experience in Niagara Falls needed to happen for me to believe that there was still more work to do because I'd won everything. I was winning everything and I was winning easily. So losing to Eddie Robinson said, "All right." I, I got to go home. I got to eat my meals. I got to dot my I. I got to cross the T's. I can't take advantage of this genetic gift that right. things are just gonna happen. Things are just gonna happen. That loss made me what I was in 1987. And of course, you know Eddie Robinson was nowhere close to me in '87. I don't think he made the top ten of that light heavyweight division that year. Yeah, I don't think he made the finals. Yeah. So what did you do in '87 then, Sean? Because I remember uh, seeing the pictures of you in uh, the magazines. You won the Mister California yeah. before that. Right, Heather Thomas, right, was the actress that was holding your hand up on this. Yes, yeah, man, she was an actress. I was like, hey, I was more excited to get the award from her <laughs> yeah. than I was winning the California. But right. I, I got to tell you that that loss to Eddie Robinson put things in perspective because not only did I have Mike Christian and, and John Brown uh, telling me that look, this this is a guy that shouldn't be beating you genetically. You're superior, but you got to get bigger. So I actually went into kind of a powerlifting mode from 86 to 87 because mm-hmm. now I'm going into the California I'm going into the Cal it was rich in history with Rory Littlemeyer and, and uh, Bob Paris winning that show and, and uh, even Mike Christian being a former California champion yeah. this was something I wanted I want and I knew if I win the Cal it sets me up for the Nationals so I I became a full-time bodybuilder even while I was in college I was a full-time college student but I knew that the Cal would be the catalyst to me becoming a professional bodybuilder so I think when your back's up against the wall, because I thought, well, hell, maybe Eddie Robinson might come out here for the California. You know, I don't know who's going to show up at the Cal, but yeah. the guys, the guys that win the Cal, are, they fare very well in the Nationals. And uh, I started spending a lot of time in Venice Beach training at Gold's Gym. It's a, like I said, 45-minute drive. It was a lonely existence for me because I'd go to college, I'd go to uh, the local gym, and then I'd drive all the way out to Venice Beach. I was training at uh, Glendora's uh, Bulldog Gym at the time. And I mm-hmm. didn't have a friend. I, John, I didn't have one friend. I, John Brown I wasn't working with. I wasn't working with or training with one individual. The 87 experience for the California and the Nationals was probably, for me, the most isolated, lonely time because I felt I needed to just not have any friends. I needed to not have a social life. I needed to try to become a pro bodybuilder. And it, it worked. Uh, I was I was home on Friday nights and Saturday nights. Uh, I didn't watch TV. I didn't want to be tempted by the food on the commercials. I listened to a lot of uh, mm-hmm. jazz music. I did. I was heavy into school. I wanted to make sure that I was getting good grades. And mm-hmm. I didn't have any. It, it, it was the longest year of my life, but it was the most fruitful year of my life because when I won the California, 
I believed I could win the nationals, but Mike Christian was the, a very instrumental uh, voice in my head. He said, you better get ripped because you were holding a lot of water here at the Cal. And yeah. Are you doing, he asked me if I was doing cardio and I said, no, because remember I, I got too skinny in 86. So I backed off the cardio. Yeah. Got to do cardio. Are you eating fish? I said, no, I'm a red meat guy. He said, you've got to eat some fish. So I started eating tons of red snapper. Um, I started doing an hour and a half of cardio, 45 minutes in the morning, 45 minutes at night from May mm. until October. And it made all the difference in the world. I was able to hold on to my size. I lost about a pound. I was like 197. And I came into that nationals a lot drier. But I also started working on my isolated isometric posing. And I utilized that Gold's Gym posing room. I'd go down to Venice Beach and I'd pose for Mike Christian, Charles Glass, anybody that would want to look at me. And mm -hmm. I think it made all the difference in terms of my muscle quality from May until October because I was really two different bodybuilders. Wow. So what did you weigh for the Nationals then, Sean? I was 197 and a quarter. I remember, wow. I remember J, J.J. Mars, J.J. Mars started laughing. He said I was too heavy. <laughs> <laughs> I, tra I trained with J.J. just off and on a little bit. He, th he thought I was going to be too heavy and too soft. And he, he literally clapped his hands and walked away after my weigh-in. And I thought – I'm going to kick his ass. I'm going to come back. I'm going to kick his he's gonna, I'm going to crush him. And and Victor Martin or Victor Richards wound up staying in my room that weekend. He was in he was in uh um New Jersey and we started hanging out and I realized that he didn't have uh, a hotel room so he wound up flopping with me but I appreciated that because he was getting me up every hour on the hour and we were doing my mandatory posing and I was wow. eating. Hmm. And it was good to have it was good to have a familiar face cuz I told you 87, I was, my family didn't even go to the Nationals. I didn't have a friend with me. So Damn. To, have Victor, to have Victor Richards, who was training with the Barbarians, who also was a very good friend and a hardcore bodybuilder, he wanted me to win that contest more than anybody else. So I, it was encouraging for him to be there snoring through the night, but also <laughs> get, getting me up to do the business. And after Friday night's prejudging, I sailed into the uh, overalls against Phil Williams. Who, uh, not Phil Williams, Phil uh, – Phil Hill, Hill. And, yeah. yeah, and I was I was taken back by his posing. I didn't know that he had that in him. He really yeah. surprised me. He surprised me with his flexibility and with his artistry. And I just thought he was going to come out like a muscle head. So after his posing routine, I got a little bit nervous. I got to tell you, but I thought I did a good enough job to win at prejudging. Well, talk a little bit about your posing too, Sean. Since we're on that subject, um, I think you shocked everybody with your routine that year. I can't remember an amateur coming in. And nailing a routine like that, uh, it was, you know, artistic. You were doing, like, lunging poses, twisting around. I see a lot of guys try to imitate that today. But back then, I don't remember ever a male bodybuilder posing like that before. Yeah, and that, that had been a, a routine that was in the works. I did it as a teenager. I just evolved. I practiced it a few times because I got the opportunity to actually pose as Junior Mr. World. And Teenage National, I had a few posing opportunities. And so I, I refined that song. I refined that posing routine until it was brought up to my level of confidence. And clearly at the Nationals, I was overly confident because I'd already won the Cal. After prejudging, everyone was telling me Friday night that literally um, – I was going to win the show. So Saturday morning, I went back for, I think, the women's bodybuilding, and I was signing autographs. I had my pictures as Mr. California, and I'm signing pictures. And <laughs> I was, you know, I was, when they say don't count your chickens to the eggs hatch or whatever, I was yeah. I, I was already I, – I had my pro career plot planned. I was yeah. uh, very, very confident when I walked out. Not to mention Lyle Alzado was going to be introducing me with Mike Katz. It just mm -hmm. seemed that everything mm – -hmm. I, I ran into Stacy Kaufman, the owner of Protan, and he tanned me up manually. And like, and, and you know what happened with Protan? That thing just took off. But yeah. that actually helped me. That helped me. My color was right. My confidence was right. My weight was right. When I heard that song, it was like I'm I'm gonna go out and make love to the stage. And I took yeah. my time. And I, I don't think we ever saw anyone else pose three and a half minutes on that level. I did. Yeah, I, I did the whole. I did the whole song. Yeah. Well, that whole contest, that Nationals was amazing. I mean, the quality in yeah. every class, but especially the light heavyweights and the heavyweights was amazing. Yeah, it was stacked, and I, I rose to the occasion, especially with my confidence. And my, I think because I, what I saw in the mirror gave me confidence, when I heard the music, I, I dialed right in. So let's talk about your pro career now. You went into um, the 88th Night of the Champions, I believe, and then Phil Hill was the winner there, and uh, I think you took fourth, right? 
Yeah, I took fourth, and I mean, look, there was a lot of moving parts. You know, I signed a contract to compete. I'm the reigning national champion. I'm on all the magazines. Mm -hmm. I couldn't say no when they when these people call me. You want to come here? You want to go there? You want to do this? You want to do that? I said yes to pretty much everything, and that also carried all the way through the Mr. Olympia in '88. But I wanted to compete. You know, I wanted to be on that national uh, that night of champion show that had so much history. I think my problem was I signed up for that show so early after winning the nationals that I didn't know what all entailed being a pro bodybuilder once the season started because now I was I started guest posing in February like. I won the nationals in October. I barely came mm -hmm. off of my off of my diet in in January. Um, I got to start training for a show that's coming up in May. So yeah. it just came to. It, and mind you, Phil Hill lost the nationals. He probably went right back to the gym the next day to train for the night of champions. I didn't. Yeah. I need. I did the California in May. I did the nationals in October. I enjoyed my family. I enjoyed the victory. I signed a contract with Joe Weider. I'm fat and happy in January, and now I got to go back on another diet, and I got to travel. I haphazardly showed up in New York, slightly embarrassed, not confident, and a little bit in awe because it's a, it was a smaller venue, um, and I we were more intimate. Like Bob Paris is right there, and Albert Pickles is right here, Robbie Robinson. I actually had an opportunity to be a fan up close and personal, whereas at the Nationals, I didn't know anyone. I didn't even know Phil Hill. I knew of mm. Victor Mar I, I knew of Vince Taylor. I I knew JJ Marsh, but outside of that, 160 something athletes, I didn't know any of them. But when I went mm. into the Night of Champions, I got a little bit starstruck because I did I didn't have the confidence in what I look like, but yeah. I was watch I was watching what they look like. Robbie Robinson warming up backstage if you've never seen it before, it's ridiculous. Like holy crap, it's <laughs> biceps. You know, I'm standing here next to I'm looking I'm actually looking at Phil Hill for the first time. You know, because after I beat him at the Nationals, I never paid him any attention until I'm backstage at the New York Pro, and I'm like, holy crap. Yeah, where, where this guy's a monster. Where did, <laughs> I beat this guy? I'm thinking, like, yeah. I beat him? <laughs> so, yeah, I, I wasn't ready. And, you know, thank God it wasn't boxing because I would have been knocked out in the first round. But this is where I had enough genetics, I had enough of a base and a foundation that it carried me over the rest of the lineup, even on my off day. I was able to land in fourth place. And at that time, the top five qualified you for the Olympia. So by the grace of God, I did get qualified for my first Olympia. And unlike the bodybuilders of today, I was overwhelmed. I'm like, holy crap. And the Olympia's in L.A.? I'm yeah, going to it is. now. You would have thought I would have jumped back in the gym and started dieting and getting ready for my first Olympia. No. I still had a full calendar of guest posings all around the world that mm -hmm. I had to fulfill before I got to even come home and train for the Olympia. By the way, I thought, I'll guest pose my way into shape. And <laughs> anybody that knows when you travel, you can't guest pose your way into shape, especially when you're competing against grown men that are at home that stop traveling three yeah. months out for a show to train for the Olympia. Well, I couldn't say no. I was getting 2,000 here, 4,000 there. Oh, I'm going to this country. I'm going to that country. I was living the life that I always envis envisioned However, I was getting for my biggest, getting ready for my biggest contest ever, and like the Night of Champions, I became a fan all over again. I'm looking mm -hmm. in the mirror. I don't see what I'm supposed to see. I've signed the contract to compete. Um, I'm gonna go. What's the worst that can happen? I'm gonna gain all this experience. I got money in the bank. It's the Mr. Olympia. Where else would you rather be? I wasn't gonna sit in the audience because I'm not in shape. So I. I took that opportunity to become a student. I said, I'm going to go and learn as much as I can so that the next time I wind up on that Olympia stage, I'll know everything that's coming my way. So there we were. In, in, we're at Universal Studios. We got these boxing robes that they gave us. We're all weighing in, so we all get a sneak peek at everybody. We get true weights. I think I was 201 pounds, and we saw Haney was like 240. I mean, it was interesting to see what the body weights were of all the bodybuilders because the magazines yeah. were all inflated. Bodybuilders lie, and the magazines inflate their weights. But if I were, I felt like George Plimpton of the Paper Lion, the, the journalist mm -hmm. that got a chance to mm -hmm. go and play play for the uh, Detroit Lions, right? To 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 report on it. Well, here yeah. I was, with a free ticket to the Olympia, and I'm kind of going to report on that experience. And uh, I, I got to tell you, I would never undo that experience. I was 13th. I was middle of the pack. Um, I was nowhere. I was, I was eating at Carl's Jr. in between prejudging and finals, but mm -hmm. I was there. I was there as a student, not as a competitor. So when I was standing there not getting the call outs, I wasn't upset. I wasn't angry. I, I understood the dynamic. But can you imagine 22? It was the day after my birthday, right? 
and my mm-hmm. grandmother died on my birthday, so my mom didn't show up that day. She was she was on the mm-hmm. way. She was dying on the way to the show. They didn't tell me, but I'm celebrating my birthday. I'm standing on the Olympia lineup. I'm watching this history take place. I've got the pictures are still on my wall at my. I'm living at home at the time. So I still got pictures of Haney and Gaspari and Labrada. Here's Barry DeMay, who I only saw in the magazines. I'm like, holy crap. Um, <laughs> and, and, and Samir Banu, 1983, was winning the Olympia when I picked up my first weight. It's, he, he played yeah. right, right next to me. There's right. Ron Love. He won the – Ron Love, I forgot, he won the, the Nationals in, what, 85 or 86, something like that. And I'm, uh, I'm just – I'm over the top with where I'm standing at on this day and thinking, where are my friends at? You know, what are they doing? Mm-hmm. I'm over. Mm-hmm. I, I'm having my I'm having my birthday at Universal Studios, but I'm up there <laughs> with these guys. So I think maybe the perception of what was happening with Sean Ray might have been like a failure to some because I came on so hard and heavy in '87 at the Nationals. But to me, it was part of my journey. Um, yeah. I had zero complaints. I was more happy to be on that Olympia lineup out of shape than I would have been sitting in the audience. Uh, passing on the show because I don't have the experience. I don't think I'm worthy. I was worthy. I think I was 13th place, right? Yeah, 13th. Um, mm-hmm. and, I, and I believe there's like 24 guys in that show. It was one of the largest Olympians yeah. ever. Uh, I beat Robbie Robinson. You know, I beat yeah. Albert Beckel. You know, right. I even though I didn't win the show, I put a few guys in my rear view. I beat Mike. I think Mike Ashley was there. I'm not sure. Yeah, he was. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I put a few guys in my rear view, so I didn't have anything to hang my head down. I mean, I just didn't have the time to prepare. So my experience in 88 shaped the rest of my Olympia appearances. It's, it was definitely yeah. something that needed to happen. It's interesting, too, what you just said about the guest posing. You know, you couldn't turn them down and get 2,000 here, 4,000 there. I think what's happened uh, recently, too, with social media is the guest posings. You know, when you, I remember being younger in the 80s, and you could go to a contest, and you would see a bodybuilder guest posing. It was a big deal. Because you never got to see them, of course, on the right. internet. There was no internet. So the only time you ever got to see them in person was at a contest. And if you didn't go to the Olympia, then you would only see them at, if they guest pose at your local contest. So it was really a big deal. Now it seems like that whole appeal of that is, is faded. You know, I, I promoted a couple shows out here for the MPC in Florida. And uh, it just doesn't seem like a lot of promoters will have big guest posers anymore because it just doesn't seem like the demand is there like it used to be. Well, not just that, but I think the athletes have taken advantage of guest posing. The athletes don't prepare to guest pose. So when you have guest poser after guest poser coming in fat, pale, showing up late, being divas, they don't come to the prejudging, they don't want to stand on stage and yeah. get out an award, they don't want to do the business, then why bother? The bodybuilders did that to themselves. I'm a promoter too, John. So mm-hmm. I – I when I had my shows in Maryland for four years running, I was bringing in decorated athletes to give them lifetime achievement awards. I didn't need to see Lee Haney guest pose. I wanted him to come up and be acknowledged for his body work. I brought yeah. out Dexter Jackson. I brought out Rich Gaspari. I wanted to honor what they gave to the sport rather than give some guy two or three thousand dollars for one and a half minutes of walking back and forth on the stage and jumping out in the audience and mm-hmm. you know not not having anything to say at the microphone uh, and take the money and run. So yeah. the bodybuilders have done that to themselves. I mean, you have a few exceptions. Jay Cutler was a blue-collar bodybuilder. Uh, he left you with an impression. Uh, he gave the fans more than they wanted. Mike Matarazzo, he'd give you more than you expect mm-hmm. um, and, and, and give some inspiration to actually being there. These guys, they don't even show up. They show up late. Hey, uh, what time does the show start? Six o'clock? What time is it over? About 10? Have someone pick me up at 9 o'clock. They don't even want to socialize with the fans. So yeah. it's a lost art. John, the guest poser. I have a show yeah. coming up in Hawaii. I have a show coming up in Hawaii on November the 4th, Shameless Plug, Hawaiian Classic. I'm bringing mm-hmm. out Breon, Breon Ansley, uh, this year's Mr. Olympia Physique, Classic Physique, and, and Danny Hester, last year's Classic Physique champion. These guys love what they do, and they love the artistry and the magistry of presentation, and this is what we want to show. This is what we're missing in the pro bodybuilding. So yeah. I don't have a problem. I don't have a problem going in my pocket for someone that's going to work for their money. But the majority of the promoters have been dealing with these bodybuilders for so many years that just under deliver and over promise that mm-hmm. they just have shows without them anymore. There's no interest. Nobody wants to. Yeah. Care. That's awesome. You're having Danny Hester and Brian Ansley, the two classic Olympia winners back to back. Well, remember, Hawaii's an island. I got my yeah. mouth full. I'm trying to cram in, cram in my lunch. Hawaii's an <laughs> island. They won't. 
they don't get a chance to see this. So with me having a show there, I'm going to bring what they never get to see mm-hmm. to them. And my show's not going anywhere. I'm going to be doing it next year, and I'm going to bring more. Yeah. So I think I think it's important to you take the show on the road. If they can't come to us, we got to go to them. So these two guys right. are ambassadors. I'm giving them a break. They're going to come out and have a great time in Hawaii. The fans will appreciate it. And mark my words, man, I'm telling you, four, four years from now, classic bodybuilding is going to be talked about more than men's bodybuilding. Oh, yeah, because I they, agree. Because of their level of commitment to the overall package and the presentation. People yeah. want to be entertained. People want to be entertained. Yeah. People want to be moved. And right now, we're, it's, we're losing that in open bodybuilding. So, Sean, let's talk about 89 and what happened there because that was an off year for you. I know you had a neck injury and you were not allowed to compete or you, you couldn't compete in the Olympia that year. And then uh, I think Wayne D'Amelio sort of got you in trouble because he suspended you a year, right? Absolutely. So, 89, I was five weeks out from the very first Arnold Classic at Rich Aspire one. Right. I was training with Mike Christian one weekend down at uh, Gold's Venice. We're doing heavy leg presses, drop sets. And while I was on my way up with the weight, I felt something kind of pop in the base of my neck all the way up to the bottom of my, my ear. Mm-hmm. And it felt like... I don't know what to compare it with, but it, it was like a spring. If you ever pulled a spring and let it go mm-hmm. and it springs back, it felt like that in my head. And I don't want to say aneurysm because that's a whole other thing, but I thought maybe I'm having like an aneurysm or something was wrong. Yeah. I racked the weight. I laid on the floor. I, my balance was off. I didn't know really kind of what to do other than just like relax. And at the time, I was living in Marina Del Rey, and you had every Tom, Dick, and Harry trying to self-analyze you. that there are, Everybody's a chiropractor at Gold's Gym. Um, so I, I kind of just kind of, I mellowed out for two days. And when I went back in there to do curls, as soon as I lifted up the weight and I applied any pressure, you know, the first thing we do is we hold our breath. And when I held my breath, I felt the pressure in the exact same spot. And I dropped the weight and I said, no, I, I, I can't do this. Right. So another day or two went by and I tried to go in there and do some light shoulders. And I just continually felt this little, ache. it was like an ache at the base of my neck. Um, I couldn't get it diagnosed. So when I went in to see the doctor and they did this electro muscle stimulation garbage or whatever, the doctor just basically said, listen, you're going to have to take at least four to five weeks off. Well, that was how much time I had to the, to the Arnold Classic. Yeah. So I let Wayne, I'm in the program. I let Wayne, mind you, I'm training for this. I've already got about eight weeks of training and dieting. Um, I let Wayne Demilio know and he's like, well, make sure you send me the medical information. So I'm getting ready to go to Columbus, Ohio. I send, I, back then I didn't have email, I had the fax. I faxed in the medical information about my muscle stimulation that I was getting and the massage therapy I was getting. So he was aware. I walk into the athlete's meeting and he tells me to leave the athlete's meeting because I'm not competing. All right, fine. I leave the athlete's <laughs> meeting. Um, I'm standing out in the lobby area and I'm trying to get an audience. Like, can I address the fans? Can I talk to the fans? Because I'm on the program. They're expecting, nope, you can't. I get home hmm. to California and I get I get a letter in the mail. I've been suspended for the balance of 1989. I'm thinking, on what grounds? I'm being suspended for getting hurt? Are you kidding me? <laughs> so that mm-hmm. was my that was my that was my welcome to the IFBB from Wayne Demilia, yeah. and um, <laughs> it never set well with me because the Olympia that year at 89 fell on my birthday in Rimini, Italy. 89 mm-hmm. was also the year that Barry DeMay tore his pec, so I wasn't going to be denied. I went on tour to Russia, and I came back, and I, I went to the, uh, the Mr. Olympia in Rimini, and Barry DeBay and I celebrated my birthday uh, in the third row of the Mr. Olympia, and, we, and I actually had the chance to watch to see what it is I'm up against. And I got to tell you, sitting in the audience watching the Olympia, I, mm-hmm. felt a million miles, I felt a million miles away from that stage. I didn't think mm-hmm. I could beat anybody on that stage. Watching mm-hmm. the Olympia in the third row – and actually seeing what these guys do to their bodies or, or with their bodies, I'm thinking, yeah. I, can't, I can't beat that guy. I mean, me and Barry DeMay had a couple of drinks, and like, can you beat him? Can you beat him? <laughs> can we stand next to that? Oh, my God. We were both, we were both self-defeated, like, this is it. We're, we're done. Yeah. Um, and, and, of course, it was in 1990 that Barry DeMay went with the WBF, and, and I stayed. I, I believed when I, when I left Rimini, Italy, that if I were ever going to get to that level again, I got to start training as soon as I get home. Mm-hmm. and I needed to be at that Rimini Italy competition to, to motivate myself to want to get back to that level. But I got to tell you, I was defeated at the Arnold because by the time that five-week period had elapsed and I'm in Ohio, I'm not hurt anymore. I'm able to turn my head from right to left. I'm able to actually lift light weight. I hadn't gone back to lifting the kind of weights I normally do, mm-hmm. but 
on all appearances, I look healthy. So Wayne's looking at me like, well, why in the hell aren't you in the show? I go, because Wayne, it was five weeks ago that I got hurt. I'm not hurt today. I was hurt then. So he may have thought I weaseled my way out. I don't know why he would have thought I would be weaseling my way out. I was already in the Olympia. I beat some of the guys that were in that contest. Didn't Robbie Robinson get second that year to Gersh Kaspari? Yep. 1989, Robbie Robinson is second place to Rich Kaspari, and I beat Robbie Robinson mm-hmm. uh, twice. I beat Robbie Robinson uh, in, um, at the Night of Champions in 88, and I beat him in the 88 Mr. Olympia. So why in the hell would I be afraid to compete in the Arnold Classic? Wayne was trying to float that as if I wanted out of the show because I didn't have that confidence, but I was yeah. fully confident. I just wasn't prepared, and so getting suspended for me, it supercharged me because the next thing I did was I drove to Weeder's headquarters, and Joe basically said, listen, so you're not in the Mr. Olympia contest. Train for the 1990 Mr. Olympia contest. Better yet, train for the 1990 Arnold Classic, right? And at that time, he didn't know that it was going to be a drug-tested show, 1990 mm-hmm. Joe Weeder. It was, that hadn't been announced. So I didn't lose my my contract with Joe, and all I wanted to, was make sure I had Joe's blessing. I didn't care about Wayne D'Amelio. But with Joe's blessing, I continually getting my monthly check. I took 1989 to get myself in halfway decent shape so I can guest pose which is how I wound up at the 89 Olympia um, in Italy because I was posing in Russia. Mm-hmm. So somewhere around April or May, I started you know, looking like a bodybuilder again because I was able to train. And by the time June, July, August, and all that stuff rolled around, I was guest posing. So I was making more money not competing in the 89 Olympia than if I had said no to prepare for the 89 Olympia. 89 was yeah. a very good year. It was a very good year for me financially because without the Olympia in my way, I had the opportunities to go to places that I wasn't going to be able to go to because I would be, I would have been training for that Olympia. But I was hmm. upset. I was I was pissed that I didn't have the chance uh, to at least tell my side of the story in 89. I got suspended unceremoniously. And the logic was I wasn't injured to the degree that was satisfactory to Wayne D'Amelio. One individual, one individual hmm. had the power hmm. over my career in 1989, Wayne D'Amelio. And he dictated that I was not worthy of trying to qualify for that year's Mr. Olympia. I don't think I ever forgave him for that. <laughs> so going into 90 then, Sean, uh, who, when did you hear about the drug testing? And whose idea was that? Was that Ben Weeder that, that came up with that? Well, yeah. I mean, Ben had always been trying to get the drug testing. He wanted Olympic recognition, right? Right. Um, I, was no, I was more happier than anybody else. I didn't feel like Gary Stridham or Lee Haney or – Barry DeMay or any of those guys could compete with me and Lee Labrada if it was a drug tested show. Mm-hmm. So when I heard that, I was I was over the moon, and that was coming to us somewhere in the summer of '89. Okay. So, so when I heard when about you... it, I don't know who I don't know who found it or whatever, but I knew that that was something that was a welcome welcome call for me. I I, I certainly didn't shy away from it. Okay. So you're getting ready now for the Ironman and then for the Arnold Classic, the first drug tested one. So, I mean, you don't have to talk about in detail. You can tell me whatever you want to tell me. But uh, when you were getting ready for the show, what changes did you make to your protocol? Well, there were no changes. I mean, I stopped taking anything that I thought might show up on a drug test naturally. So mm-hmm. even though I failed, even though I failed the test at the Arnold Classic one week after the Ironman, um, I failed the test for Winstrel, and Winstrel wasn't something in my protocol from December of 89 to March of 1990, which is what mm-hmm. baffled everybody that I told the story to because Winstrel V for me, uh, being a water-based drug, it's not something that's going to get you big and strong. That's not what yeah. that's designed to. It's, it's a polishing chemical. When you're training upwards of three, four hours a day, uh, tearing down your body. It helps repair and build. It also makes the muscles harder. Mm-hmm. So it's a very fast-acting drug that's in and out of your system. It's not something that's going to blow you up from 200 to 220 pounds. It's a finishing drug that will help polish your look. Yeah. Um, and th- that wasn't something that I was going to carry over into uh, the new year because the drug test was coming. So knowing that I had used it in December – of 1989 and I tested positive in March, the first week of March of 1990, I didn't have a leg to stand on. I couldn't get upset. I couldn't be mad at anyone. I didn't know. I didn't have the intelligence to beat a drug test. I just mm-hmm. assumed a water-based fast-acting drug would be in and out of your system literally within days, not, you know, months. 
You're talking yeah. all of January and all of February. That's two months. That's eight weeks of not having that in my system. However, whatever amounts showed up on the scale, what's legal and what's not legal? Like, I don't know what the spike looked like. Is it 0.1%? Yeah. 0.1% or was it like being drunk, like 2.0? <laughs> so right. there, there was no... There was no real, there was no real clarity on what's positive and what's not, what's natural, yeah. what's not. Like we didn't get tested for our natural testosterone levels, so they were just looking for chemicals that were in our system, and they had a list. And if that chemical showed up, you're positive. Mm -hmm. I didn't, okay. have, I didn't have a leg. To, I didn't have an argument. I, my argument was, look, you guys screwed up. You should have got this test result back earlier. Um, people thought it was a sham. I mean, all the bodybuilding purists didn't buy into that drug test. They thought it actually did more harm than it did good. To mm -hmm. kind of unring the bell, unring the bell, and unceremoniously hand Mike Ashley the trophy. You know, weeks later after the show had been done, and the magazines come out three months later, it didn't. Look, it wasn't a good look for the IFBB at that time. As right. for me, I think uh, as for me, uh, I wasn't as disappointed because people keep saying, "Did you have to give the money back?" I never had the money. I was presented mm -hmm. an empty envelope. I was presented okay. an empty envelope pin, pending the drug testing results. So okay. I've never seen six. I'd never seen a $60,000 payday in my life. And in my mind, I had that money spent going into that show because I felt there was no one in that lineup that was going to beat me. Mm -hmm. And winning the Ironman even gave me more confidence headed into Columbus, Ohio. So it wasn't like I won the Ironman, I took Winstrel V, and I beat Mike Ashley again. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I won that Ironman as natural as most of those guys could have potentially have been. We were all in the same boat. And – I wasn't alone in failing that test at the Arnold Classic, and I don't need to point fingers, but there were other guys that failed that didn't get looked at or scrutinized because I was the winner. So in my mind's eye, I was the Ben Johnson of bodybuilding for that moment in time, but it came late in the game. By the time it's, it pilfered out into the public, nobody cared because I was on yeah. the cover of the magazine. I had won the show, uh, and now you're going to change the results. Not just me, but when you take me and several of the other guys that failed the test, it changed the entire lineup, so it made it an entirely different contest. Mm -hmm. And the fa the fans were like, "Sean won the show. We don't care, <laughs> you know. You yeah. can give it to Mike Ashley all you want, but Sean won the show." So I right. felt bad for Mike. I felt bad for Mike because again, if they'd done it right, Mike would have had his moment in the sun. I would have never right. even been on the stage. They should have right. had the results back after. They should have got the results back after prejudging. Right. So right. I Which think is what they did with the Olympia, it, right? Yeah, which is what they did. By the time we got to the Olympia, they got it right. They got it back before prejudging, so those mm -hmm. athletes couldn't even take. They couldn't even take to the stage. But here's what was going yeah. on: our industry was going to self implode if they continued on that road because the bodybuilders were already set in their ways. I mean, you mm -hmm. had six or seven of us. Six or seven of us failed at the Arnold in Ohio. Another six or seven failed in Chicago. I mean, it was a matter of time before you had another five or six fail later on and later on. And then you don't have you don't have anybody who wants to compete because they can't trust the test. Yeah. And then you had Vince McMahon hovering around offering hundreds of thousands of dollars to come join his federation. So right. they had to immediately back off of any idea of drug testing at that point in time. And I was caught in the middle because, of course, Vince McMahon called me as well. Mm -hmm. um, failing that Arnold Classic, naturally, I was afraid that anything could happen in September in Chicago. So I was not going to even take so much as a multivitamin. And hmm. I didn't. I didn't. Really? So from, so, March, so... From, from March of 89, or of 1990, uh -huh. to September uh, of 1990, I ate my food. That was the only thing I was willing to eat. I didn't want anything to show up on our next drug test. I was definitely afraid that something might show up. So yeah. I was as clean I was clean as clean can be hmm. from pretty much from pretty much January of ninety through September and I moved from thirteenth place to third place. So I had a lot to wow. be proud of at that Mr. Olympia. Wow, that's amazing, Sean, because I, I remember seeing that show in uh nineteen ninety at the Olympia. I was in Chicago at the time, so I went and saw that show and I was like, Wow, what did he do? Because he looks just as good as uh at, at the Arnold Classic, but this time he passed the test. Well, I, I, my back kind of diminished a little bit. Uh, I wasn't probably training as heavy. I was mm -hmm. training more for I was training more for detail because I felt like you know Lee Haney natural is not without his mass he's not going to be as impressive. So let me get ripped because Labrada's going to be yeah. ripped. Yeah. So I think I might have over dieted to overcompensate for not training heavy in the off season for the 1990 Olympia. 
and uh-huh. I look at it, my lat spread wasn't right. I was still kind of messing with my front double bicep. I really didn't have the vacuum to the com- to the comfort level I wanted it to be. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I didn't feel big. I didn't feel bulky, but I felt very streamlined and athletic. And, uh, and it showed. I was a lighter slender, but everybody was lighter and slender. I think yeah. nobody exhibited a, a lot of muscle mass. Uh, Mike Christian, of course, we can talk about him. But when I go back and I look again, he, he had more vascularity than other guys, but he, his legs were still skinny. His hamstrings weren't mm-hmm. even there. His, cal- mm-hmm. his calves were really, were really diminished. Mike was all arms and chest, and he had, a lot, he had very thin onion skin, and he had a lot of vascularity. So a lot of us didn't believe he was natural. But yeah. when I go back and I look, I go back and I look, he didn't have a whole lot of on- enormous girth to him. He looked slender. Mm-hmm. And all of us looked flat. I think all of us looked smooth. Lee Haney was smooth. I was smooth. All of us yeah. looked a little bit down in size, but that's to be expected. I trained, I, I overcompensated for the drug test I, I failed in March to the Olympia in November because I wanted to be ripped. And trying to be ripped, I just think I, I overdied and got small. What do you think the placing should have been at that 1990 Olympia? I definitely thought I beat Labrada. I, I, they, I think they let Labrada beat me a couple of years longer than he actually should have because there's no mm-hmm. way a 19 I – don't, I don't feel on any level, even though Labrada apparently was leading after the prejudging, according to him, yeah. um, and maybe even the scorecards. Labrada was leading, apparently, Lee Haney. Uh, I, I never felt for one second that Labrada was going to beat me in 1990, and I didn't think he was going to beat me in 91. And I didn't think he was going to beat me in 92. Finally, I beat mm-hmm. LeBron in 93. But yeah. when I go back and I look at those three years, I thought for those three years, I should have been beating LeBron um, on post, when you go pose for pose. Now, 1990, uh, it was easier for me to swallow because I thought either me and Lee are going to be first and second, and, and Lee Haney's going to be third, or Lee Haney's going to win it, and I'm going to be second place. That was my mindset because mm-hmm. I just didn't believe. I just didn't believe that pose for pose, Labrada was going to beat me. And what he did, it just pissed me off. But yeah. listen, it's easy, it's easy to lose to somebody as decorated as Lee Haney when you're a fan and you're in awe. Um, and he stands almost four inches taller than you. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you can, ju- you can justify it. Look, he's got six Olympia titles. Well, he's five foot ten. Well, he's still, even though he's small, he still outweighs me. I found ways to justify win- Lee Haney winning the 1990 Olympia. And a good big guy beats a good small guy. I wasn't at my best. Lee Haney wasn't at his best. So all things being equal, Lee Haney still looked like Lee Haney natural. And I still looked like Sean Ray natural. But I lose mm-hmm. the wow factor because I'm – I lost the wow factor because I'm smaller. Yeah. What do you think Mike should have played? Like Mike was where he needed to be. I mean, Mike was yeah. where he needed – he was better than Gaspari because genetically I think he's got a better shape. Gaspari yeah. off – when Gaspari's off, it shows all of his flaws. Mm-hmm. Um, Mike is a tall, slender bodybuilder at six foot, and his legs really get diminished when he's not loaded. His hamstrings and calves were already always problematic. He had a world class back, great arms, yeah. nice vascularity, thin skin. Um, but I just didn't think that who was sixth place that year? Um, was it was it Frank Hildebrand or Francis Benfato was? Benfato, so, yeah. Mike. Yeah, Ben Fado wasn't going to beat Mike Christian. I don't think Gaspari was going to beat Mike Christian. I, I, all things being equal. I don't think anybody can really complain about 1990. I mean, Lee Haney was mm. not Lee Haney, but with or without, Lee Haney's still Lee Haney. You follow me? That blueprint's yeah. still there. Yeah. And me and mm-hmm. are just too sh- me and Labrada were just too short to take him out. But that contest, for me, was between me and Lee Labrada. That was the guy that I needed to take out to really make my point. And yeah. when that didn't happen, when that didn't happen in 90, I was kind of pissed off um, and felt like I'd have another shot. And who knew it was going to take me another two years to get public acknowledgement from our judges um, that, you know, I would send Lee Labrada into retirement. What do you think the reason is that they didn't continue with it? Do you think it's because the fans didn't want it or because they just didn't no, have that drug listen, testing yeah, down? Listen, but listen, you can't – it's bodybuilding 101, you know. Yeah. They have, nat- they have natural federations and they do their thing. But we're grown men, you know. You have non-smoking section. You have a smoking section. <laughs> you have the guys that drink alcohol, the guys that don't – we're grown men. It's hard right. to tell grown men what they can and can't do with their own bodies. And at the end of the day, you know, the power lifters, the football players, the track and field athletes, I mean, you single one out, you got to go after everybody. And back in those times, John, uh, you know, bodybuilders weren't dying from steroids. So it's almost like yeah. we're, we're, trying to, we're trying to push back by going, look, 
You know, go after the guy over here who's got cancer and he's still smoking cigarettes. Go after the guy over here who's drinking beyond the limits and he's getting in this car and he's driving. I mean, you guys are the ones that are trying to enforce drug testing on us. Like, for me, I think I, I would have welcomed drug testing if it could have stuck, but we would have had a different sport. And then you lose its popularity because we're not looking at these people that are like works of art. I mean, drugs has just a negative connotation. If they, if they didn't work, people wouldn't take them. The problem that we had mm-hmm. is the regulation, the regulation of it all. It's it's black market, it's voodoo science, and you got guys that if a little bit's good, a lot must be better, and one drug leads to another. So I think initially the purpose was to try to like save us from ourselves. If you yeah. have that guy, you have those bodybuilders that don't know their limitations, and of course they die of something related. You know whether it's oxycotton or freaking heroin. I mean, there's a lot of bodybuilding related deaths that were precipitated by their steroid use or uh, mm-hmm. steroid abuse. And then you have smart guys like Labrada and, and Rich Kaspari, these scientists guys that, you know, they, they're able to find their way through it and use it properly to where it benefits them and not abuse it. But even in that, um, having a third party trying to regulate it uh, would have cannibalized our sport to the point where we wouldn't have had athletes. And when Vince McMahon brought it into his, WBF Bodybuilding Federation, he, you know, he wound up with a fat Mike Quinn. I mean, Mike Christian mm-hmm. wound up looking like garbage because they were doing whatever they wanted. And the drug testing was the reason why they didn't feel like they needed to train hard because they were going to get paid no matter what. Mm-hmm. So, so mm-hmm. it was a very, it was a very slippery slope, but look, there's federations that have drug tests. Let those athletes go there. Mm-hmm. Let these bodybuilders do what they want to do. That's where I come from because as a grown man, I don't want to be, have someone tell me, how fast to drive my car. I know if I drive my car fast, I'm subject to crash and burn or get a speeding ticket. I know that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So let, let me dr- let me drive my car. Now, when it comes to my body, let me do what I, with my body what I want to. A girl, we can't tell a woman whether or not she can get boob implants. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we can't se- tell a woman whether or not she can get a hysterectomy right. or, have an abor- or have an abortion or whether she needs to be on birth control. So when you start getting into these sports and you want to tell a guy what he can and can't do, that's where you're going to run into problems. The sport, it will change the appeal of the sport to the mm-hmm. degree that the governing bodies may be out of work. You know, the Mr. Olympia may disappear because nobody wants to compete yeah. anymore. And now, yeah. and now the whole machine falls apart. The supplement industry is suffering. The gym suffering. The trainers are suffering. And now you don't even have bodybuilders anymore. So the slippery slope that I can't figure out, it's like the Rubik's Cube. I don't, I'm, I'm all for drug testing. I mean, yeah. if we didn't have to t- if we didn't have to take drugs, we, we probably wouldn't have other problems. But this is body dysmorphia. These athletes they come in because they have low self esteem. They come in because they're fat, because they're skinny, because they're weak, because they want to be supermen, and all these things. And they bring all of their vices with them: the good, the bad, and the ugly. And it's on public display. And when mm-hmm. we try to regulate it, when you try to regulate it, you're going to have episodes that happened in 1990 at the Arnold Classic. And now the Federation looks bad. I survived it. I actually thrived after that. My career took off after I failed mm-hmm. a drug test. Right. I mean, I'm not wearing it as a badge of honor. I was the first guy to ever fail a drug test. But you know what? Mm-hmm. I came out on the other side better better than it. Ben Johnson was ruined. Yeah. You know? Lance Armstrong. He was mm-hmm. ruined. And who's Very that black dumb. chicken in <laughs> track and field? Yeah. There's so many careers that were yeah. ruined. And, you know, Mark McGuire kind of side-skirted things. Sammy Sosa side-skirted but I mean, they were doing it in every sport. So at the time, and remember, we got to keep the context. At the time in the 90s, it wasn't a taboo. We look at it right. now, and go, oh, steroids, blah, blah, blah. It right. wasn't a taboo, and the athletes pretty much had a handle on it. It wasn't until later when we got into growth hormone and insulin and mm-hmm. Oxycontin mm-hmm. And, and GHB and all this other – and all these gurus that we started seeing bodybuilders die. Yeah, and, yeah. And no, no one's accountable. No one's responsible. And the only thing we can say it's – because of is because of the steroids, which still the general public doesn't understand that there's not a steroid. There's there's as many steroids as there are vitamins on the market, and mm-hmm. there's women that there's women that use steroids. There's there's some there are benefits to its use. We run into a problem when it's abused. Hell, if I eat too much steak, I'm gonna have a problem, right? Yeah. If yeah. I drive my car too fast too soon, I'm gonna have a problem. Mm-hmm. So I don't know who monitors that, but right now, I mean, as far as I'm concerned. Being 17 years removed from the stage, if we did it all over again, I don't know what they could change. The smart thing they did was getting rid of the drug test. That was the smartest thing they did. Because bodybuilding took off in the 90s bigger than it ever was in the 80s after that drug test. Yeah. 
And it's interesting, too, you mentioned the WBF. From what I remember, I know the WBF ended up doing the drug test, but I think that was because of the problems Vince McMahon was having with wrestling, and then he, you know, brought that over to his new new bodybuilding organization. But from what I remember yeah. in the beginning when he was trying to recruit guys, he was telling everybody, hey, we're not going to do drug testing. You guys can get as big and freaky as you want over here. Absolutely. And it was yeah. – in the initial in the initial phases of it, mind you, 1990 Olympia was drug tested. At that Olympia in Chicago, Tom Platt made the announcement and did the right. recruiting because it, it was after that I got on a plane. I remember fly, flying first class with Grand Air straight to Stanford, Connecticut, right into Vince McMahon's WWE. Mm-hmm. They weren't talking about drug. They weren't talking about drug testing. So listen, right. that was very appealing to Gary Stratum and Mike Christian and Barry Demay. Barry Demay failed the drug test in 1990. Yeah, he you know failed that, right? it in Chicago. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, he, so, so can you imagine Vince McMahon goes, "Hey, come compete with me. We'll give you three hundred thousand dollars a year, and you don't have to be I'm drug tested." Do drug testing. Yeah. All those guys, the thirteen guys that they got from Vince Comerford to uh, Danny Padilla, uh, they all went because they realized there wasn't going to be any drug testing. And their mm-hmm. money was going to be guaranteed. Their money was going to be guaranteed. They didn't know that in 1991 that the IFBB was going to throw out the drug testing. Yeah, and then the WBF was going to pull the pull the rug out from under them and say, "Now we're going to do drug testing." Right, because the wrestlers were coming under scrutiny, and that whole mm-hmm. thing went belly up. And it was in yeah. 1991. 1991, bodybuilding took off again um, and created household IPB. names from a lot of yeah for the IFBB made some household names for a lot of bodybuilders, built a lot of careers. Yeah, so you made the right decision. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I made the right. I listen. They were offering me less money than my, than my training partner at the time, Troy Zuccolato, who never competed as a pro. And yeah. they were trying to create character. They were trying to create characters out of us. So when Troy went down there, Troy was offered two hundred fifty thousand for one year, two seventy five for the second year. And then I went down there, and they were offering me two twenty five for the first year, two fifty for the second year. And for me, it was a matter of principle. I just got third in the Mr. Olympia. Mm-hmm. I had already I'd already competed in the 1988 Olympia. Troy had never even touched the pro stage, and they were offering him more money. And mm-hmm. Tom Platz was trying to justify it based on personality, look, and image, and workload. That's how we arrived at your salary. I'm like, look, I just beat Gary Stridham. He's your number one guy. Gary got a three-year, $400,000 a year contract. That's $1.2 million. Mm-hmm. So I was going to get a contract that was less than 500000 and I had to get my arms around the idea that they're going to give Gary – twice my salary, yeah. three times my salary. And so it was a simple decision that I would rather stay an independent, free spirit because I had my Lifestyles of the Fit and Famous video. I was traveling the world. No one could travel anywhere with the WW, WBF. Vince McMahon mm. was not – you couldn't do anything. You couldn't go anywhere unless it was at his direction. So I, I didn't want to be inhibited in traveling, um, and I wanted to see the world. I said that when I was a teenager. What do you want to do? I said, I want to be like Bob Paris. I want to be on magazines. I want to see the world. I want to make money, right? Mm-hmm. Well, I was, going to lose that. I was going to lose that in the context of what the WBF was offering. And I would be privy to the information that I was going to make less than a guy that never competed as a pro and less than a guy that I just got done beating <laughs> in head-to-head competition. Right. For those reasons, I thought, I'm going to stick this out because, look, I just got third in the Olympia, and Lee Haney doesn't have that much more gas in the tank. He may be right. gone in a year or two, and I might, I might be Mr. Young. Olympia. Yeah. yeah, I might be Mr. Olympia fighting Lee Labrada. So I, I hung steadfast to the belief that I could beat Lee Labrada at some time, and it would be me and him fighting for the Mr. Olympia title. And the landscape in the IFTB would change to the smaller bodybuilder like it was with Chris Dickerson and Samir Banu. And mm-hmm. unfortunately, we, did, we never saw Dorian Yates coming in 1991. That kind of was a spoiler, followed by Ronnie Coleman. I still say I made the right decision to be an independent contractor and worked with Joe Weider for 17 years of my career. Do you think if they would have did the drug testing, if they would have figured it out, that the sport would have taken a different direction and we wouldn't have had the mass monsters like uh, Dorian and then Ronnie? Absolutely. I don't yeah. know if it would have been better or worse because mm-hmm. those guys brought a lot. They brought a lot to the sport, uh, irrespective of the negative you know, bloated stomachs and, mm-hmm. and the, the, the quest for size. I think if we wanted to change the sport, we would have had to change the judges. And that wasn't happening in the 90s uh, under the tutelage of Wayne D'Amelia. So you got the same – they got force-fed the same thing all the time. Mm-hmm. Now, had the judges mm-hmm. changed, Labrada could have had Olympia. I could have had Olympia. Kevin Leveroni could have had Olympia. Hell, Vince Taylor mm-hmm. could have had one. And it would have changed the dynamic of the interest in our sport. So I don't mm-hmm. think that the drug testing would have been more effective as opposed to changing the judges on a year-to-year basis so that everyone had a fair shot at winning. Because, yeah. you know, you got – 
you got 53 years of the Mr. Olympian, you got 13 champions. So right. I right. still say, I still, I still say, do the math. You know, mm-hmm. same judges, same results. And I went out on the Mr. Olympia stage in 2001, fighting that uh, that sentiment at the press conference in 01. Mm-hmm. That look, until you guys change the judges, you're gonna you're gonna wind up getting the same stuff. And I retired in 01, and Ronnie Coleman went on to win another four Olympia titles. Yeah, you're right. That's a great point because uh, people talk about well, if in 1990 they would have kept doing it, you know, we wouldn't have had these guys turn into huge guys like they turn, ended up turning into. But you're right; it's the judging too because. You go back to 1982 and 19 and, and the years when Zane was winning it from 77 to 79, 1983 when Samir won. Those judges preferred or gave credence to guys who had good symmetry, who had good posing, smaller guys like McAway and, and Samir and Chris Dickerson, where the judging obviously changed then in the 1990s because they were preferring the bigger guys. Yeah, and it was effective for a little while. The novelty wore off. I think I was the wrong messenger. I was the wrong messenger at the wrong time, trying to warn them that Mm -hmm. keep doing this. It's gonna it's gonna kill the sport. A lot of people thought I had self interest about myself, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I was I was still a fan. I was still a historian. I said, you guys keep doing it. (laughs) You know the chickens are gonna come home to roost. And I think we're living Mm -hmm. in a day and age where we're living in a day and age where if they had to listen back there, and you know when I was saying those things, we would have a different quality of sport. Yeah, uh, we'd have prob- we'd probably have different uh, variety of champions, and it would have been better holistically for everyone. But now mm-hmm. we're looking at potentially the extinction of the interest in our sport because if these guys can listen in three years, Dexter Jackson will be gone, right? I think uh, Cedric McMillan will probably be gone. I think Sean Rhodes mm-hmm. will be gone. I know for a fact Phil Heath will be gone. The whole landscape will change, and where is the future yeah. coming from? Where is the future yeah. coming from? I, our, our national champions are. Our USA champions, the, the quality and the depth, it's just not there. Uh, no. I, I mm-hmm. used to know, I used to know where these guys are coming from because they were coming out of the teenage years. They were coming out of the junior nationals. They were coming yeah. out of these other state shows, and that, now you just don't see it. So that's why I say, classic physique may be the, the the wave of the future because we're starting to really take a look at how good they are. Robert Tim, mm-hmm. Brian Ansley. I mean, look at Jeremy Bundia in the physique division. I mean, these guys are becoming household names. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the Roly Winklers and the Big Ramis and, and Dexter Jackson and Sean Roden, they may be able to carry the torch for another couple of years. But when they're gone, where are we at? Who are we, yeah. who are we dealing with? It's a great point. Excellent point because I, I think you're right on the money. Because you don't – who is coming up in the amateur ranks? That's exciting. You know, there's nobody like – like you said, uh, you know, all the guys that won the nationals before – would go right into the pros, and we knew they were going to go into the pros, and they would usually always win the Night of the Champions. How many years did the guy who won the Nationals go right away and next year and win the Night of the Champions? It just doesn't happen. We don't see it, bro. Right. So the, the only interesting division right now we got is the 212. It seems yeah. like we're hanging our hat on that. Why are we Why are we looking at the smaller bodybuilders? Because they're more competitive, they're in better condition, better shape, um, and they, they're actually – trying to kind of put together posing routines, whereas the guys that are there right now have been doing it so long, don't really care. Yeah. Their lack their lack of interest in showing us something special is going to be to their demise. And I think if these classic guys start really nailing some great posing routines like what used to be, like what you did, McAway did, Labrada, I think it's really going to take off then. Yeah, and you know what? That's what you want to see. You want to be entertained. I don't want to see Absolutely. some guy 300, 300 pounds walking back and forth, looking for applause, not really caring what their posture is, don't care what they're posing to, and and really are giving you a glimpse of what they potentially look like. Mm-hmm. They're not, the, effort's, the effort's not there. When you see somebody put a half-ass effort, you half-ass pay attention to it. Yeah. You know, I, I used to be able to tell you what the guys posed to. You know, Phil Hill. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The Phantom of the Opera, right? Bob right. Harris was posing to Tracy Chapman, and uh, Barry DeMay was posing to U2, and Kevin LeBron was playing to, posing to Creed. I mean, because I remember what they brought to the stage. I don't remember what the hell these guys were posing to this year. <laughs> right. I know. They didn't Absolutely. Give, they didn't give me a reason. They didn't give me a reason to remember. They got five or six different song changes. They're running across the stage from one side to the other. They're begging for applause. Their stomachs are hanging out. They're doing a bunch of back shots while they look at themselves on the on the LED screens, mm-hmm. and then they want you to, they want you to get up and give them a, a round of applause for what? Yeah, yeah. 
I've yeah, it's amazing. Those bodybuilders for, I've been challenging those bodybuilders for years to try to g- give me a reason to be excited, and it just, yeah. it's not coming. Yeah. It's amazing today, 30 years later. I mean, I can hear a song on the radio or whatever, and I'm like, oh, yeah, that's you That's uh, you too. That's what uh, Barry DeMay posted with the 88 Olympia. You know, I mean, it's indelible in your mind that you remember it, you know. Absolutely. And Lee Haney posting to Excalibur. I mean, come on, man. Yeah. Those days are gone. Yeah, exactly. All right, Sean. Well, thank you again for uh, joining us for this interview. You had some really, really great insights. I'm glad we got a chance to talk about the 1990 Olympia and some other things. We wish you the best with your contest on November 4th out in Hawaii. I think that's going to be a great show. I think you got some really great guest posers. Best of luck also with Generation Iron and what you're going to do with them. Yeah, absolutely. Generation Iron is the wave of the future. Just check us out on uh, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. We're going to be highlighting a lot of other areas of the industry as well, not just the athletes, but the people that actually generate the business, you know, the tanning mm-hmm. companies, the hair and makeup companies, you know, the gym owners, the personal trainers. Uh, we've got a lot of great stuff in the in the works, so make sure you follow me over at uh, Generation Iron. But okay. I appreciate the work, John. All right. All right. Keep it up. All right, Sean. Thanks for your time again, buddy. Take care. All right, thanks to Sean Ray for that interview. And as promised, here is our little snippet of Sean talking to Wayne D'Amelia at the 2001 Mr. Olympia press conference. Check it out. This question is for Wayne again, getting back to the judging. I know you made the comparison to professional sports, uh, that they don't use a hat raffle, but the referees are also accountable for what they do by everyone that sees it. Now, in the IFBB, are the judges held accountable? Can the athletes uh, look at their score sheets and see what judge placed them where? I know in the NPC, as an athlete, I'm able to look and see what judges place me where so I can you know, go up and ask judges. Yes, they can. All they got to do is ask me. I'll send them out the breakdown sheet. Thank you. Uh, yes, oh, my hold question on, hold is... On, hold on a second. Did you say no or yes to that question? We can look at the total score for the judge. No, Sean, you can ask me for the breakdown sheet and you'll get a fax to you. I've been on this stage for 14 years. Let me start. If you can produce a, a sheet of paper from last year's Olympia, that has the individual scores that any athlete that was in last year's Mr. Olympia has seen, It'd be the first time I've seen it. And it all, it's also the first time I'm hearing that we can actually see the individual scores from the judges. Because the, the paper that we are handed out, and actually the general public gets as well, is only the total score. There is no individual judges with their names next to their scores that any of the athletes have seen. And you can go down this list and ask the athletes if they've seen it, because I haven't. As a matter of fact, the last time that that was implemented, one or two of the athletes got out of control and tried to attack one or two of the judges. <laughs> and the judges decided at that point that they would not put their individual names to their individual scores to protect their well-being. Now that's, I can understand that. And since that time, which I believe was 1988, or 1989, somewhere in there, I've been in 11 Mr. Olympians. And I've yet to see that type of a format ever since. And this is the first time I'm hearing that we can actually go to Wayne D'Amelia and get that piece of paper because it's never been offered. So it's hard for us as athletes to ask for something that we don't know that we have access to. That being said, I don't think that we should have to go to the IFBB president to get a piece of paper that he already has to find out the individual scores from the judges. I mean, we're all grown men. I'm 36 years old, and I think the youngest guy is about 28. Bodybuilding has changed over the years, and so have the attitudes of the athletes, and so is the prize money. And if you have one or two loose screws out there that try to attack a judge, you shouldn't penalize all the athletes because of it. This is part of why we're being held back as a sport. And to make the comparison to referees in the NFL or in the NBA as compared to bodybuilding as a sport, we know that's not true. There is no comparison to the NFL or the NBA. Otherwise, we'd get a TV on Saturday night. change anything, this is the farm. This is the farm. And if I'm shooting myself in the foot, my physique will back it up come Saturday night. So that be <laughs> this is why we have a press conference 
because if all of you guys complain when it's all over and done, and Ronnie's got the trophy, he's gone. And I don't like hearing it. I'm tired of hearing it. This is the form because your input changes things. And if we hear it loud and clear, stop sitting there being afraid to ask that question. Wayne's here for this reason. We're here for this reason. You know, to, to ask the question, what did we do differently last year compared to this year? What do you see us and you'll see what we did different. Let's get some stuff out on the table that we can change the sport so that next year's Olympia is better than this one. And we didn't do that last year. We haven't made any progress. There's nothing changing with the judges. Yeah, we have 22 judges that are in rotation. But nobody's asked the question out of those 22 judges, how many judges judged us last year that will be judging us this year? That's a very important question to know. How many of those judges that judged me last year will be judging me this year? That's important to know. Whether we have 58 judges, 22 judges, or 12. If there's seven of them judging me again in the consecutive year, then what have we accomplished? We haven't done anything. So those are questions that need to be asked. And use your time wisely while you're here so we can make changes, so we can increase the prize money. We have a web telecast that you can pay $10 or $25 to log on. If we have 100,000 people that log on to that at $10 a piece, that's a million dollars. Our prize money has increased this year by about $25,000. There's going to be 11 guys that leave this show Saturday night with nothing in their pocket. These are issues that these kind of press conferences need to fix. Bubblegum, how chased you are. <laughs> Save it for later. Let's get some stuff out of here. I mean, I'm, I'm hungry, you know, and, and I'm frustrated because you guys are the ones that email me. You guys are the ones that say out in the lobby, what's wrong with it? I don't know what's wrong with it. These guys do. Let's get it out and talk about it. So when you come to the mic, thank your athletes and say whatever you got to say, but let's try to have some more content here so that these judges hear you. So the IFB official hears you, so that maybe some of that web telecast money trickles down to the athletes that are putting it on for these people in Australia, Germany. A million dollars is a lot of money. A hundred and two thousand dollars may be a lot of money to the postman, but we do this 365 days a year, and that prize money for that champion has been the same for 10 years. I mean, somebody needs to address it. Ronnie's not going to complain. He gets the check every year. <laughs> so who are you going to hear from? You're going to hear from me. Yeah, yeah, you're going to hear another judge. And as well, the judges will have their say. The judges can have their say. But the problem that we have is that when somebody stands up in the audience to address the judges and address the judging issues, it's an open and shut place. Nobody follows it up. Wayne sat there and said that the athletes have access to a piece of paper with the individual scores. I saw that paper like two years of my 13, 14 year career. If that's true, come Saturday night, the paper I get hopefully will not have the judges' totals. It will have every individual judge that judges the scores in each round that they judge it so that we get the final product, one that they had when they judged, not the one that has no scores next to their names. I don't understand what the problem is with that, but I certainly shouldn't have to go and make a special trip to Wayne Amelia's room to get that piece of paper. It should be with all the rest of the stuff that everybody else has. What are we hiding? So let's turn the lights on and get it out there so that every athlete understands an opportunity. Please watch. All right, thank you for listening to this episode of the Bodybuilding Legends podcast. I want to thank our guest, Sean Ray. And if you're in the Hawaii area, be sure to check out his contest this weekend out there. Next week, we will have an interview with Dr. Robert Goldman. And Dr. Goldman was the man who was in charge of the drug testing at the 1990 Mr. Olympia. So it's going to be really interesting to hear his thoughts about how he tested the competitors. And Dr. Goldman was also involved with the IFPB for many years doing their drug testing at the World Championships and many other contests. So that's going to be a great interview on the Bodybuilding Legends podcast. I want to thank our sponsors, Redcon One, Old School Labs, and Florida Alternative Medicine for sponsoring this edition of the Bodybuilding Legends podcast. Take care, everybody. We'll see you guys next week. Thank you.